Um, so just a couple of housekeeping things. First of all, for those that, um, that I don't know, my name is Jeff Gaines. I'm the chief medical officer at Newport Hospital. And my background, I'm an emergency doc. And so I've worked in the ER for uh, about 12 years at Newport. In the last couple of years now, I've been this, the chief medical officer. Um, and I have a very special guest we're excited to have is Ariana DeAngelis. Um, and so she is the training manager at the Autism Project. Um, she has um, some training in psychology um, at Holy Cross and then from Emmanuel College in Boston. She had her bachelor's degree in developmental and child psychology and then finished her master's of education with a special education degree um, from Bridgewater State University. And now for the last um, few, long time actually, um, few years, you've been working at the Autism Project. So um, I'm super excited to have you on the virtual community lecture series for Newport. Um, we were just talking as people were logging on that some of her colleagues did a little radio slot um, and we got a chance to hear a little bit about um, some, you know, topics around autism, raising some awareness, which I think is great. Um, we got to hear some of the specific things that are happening here in Newport, which is the part I love to focus on just because it amazes me. Some of the resources that we have access to right here in our community, which I think is great. Um, we can talk about some of the affiliations that you have and how you're connected to the hospital. Um, but most importantly, uh, just how you address some of the needs of families um, and especially now with the pandemic and things, I can only imagine that the demand for your services has got to be um, pretty legendary at this point. So, um, so that's kind of quick introductions, a um, couple quickies for the um, attendees. Um, again, thank you guys for joining. Um, if you look at your Zoom toolbar, which is usually on a computer down towards the bottom, if you're on an iPad, it might be at the top you'll see a couple little options. So you won't right now have a mute unmute video button yet, uh, but you will find a Q and A which has two little cartoon bubbles. And then there's a chat one that has a little one cartoon bubble. Um, honestly, either one of those works just fine. Um, so I think Mary already tried out the chat box. So you'll see a little question from her. Um, so I know you know how to use that. So what I will do is I'll keep an eye on those boxes. So if you put anything in either of the questions or the chat box, um, I will take a look at those. And Ariana was saying that she doesn't mind taking a pause, taking a water break, taking a breather. Um, and so we can throw some questions in the middle um, if you have some specifics. And then certainly towards the end, um, we'll have a little Q and A. And so I wanna make sure you take this opportunity to talk to Ariana because she has a very unique perspective and a, a great expertise, which we value. So I'd love for you to take up that opportunity. So. With that being said, I will hand things over to Ariana, who um, will go through some of the work that she does at the Autism Project and how it benefits Newport. And I will stand by and keep an eye on the chat boxes. So thank you again, Ariana, for being part of this presentation and for all the hard work that you do to support the families and the patients that have uh, autism and other similar related conditions um, and for what you do in Newport. Much appreciated. Oh, it's my pleasure, Dr. Gaines. And thank you to all of you in the medical community who have gotten this country through the last two years. So there's no amount of gratitude that us here at the Autism Project can express to all of you. I also thank all of you here for taking the time tonight to join us to talk about the Autism Project and also about back to school and some of the challenges that are coming. As Dr. Gaines said, with that transition back to school, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm sure all of us here, maybe with the exception of Dr. Gaines, thought that this school year was going to be significantly different and masks would be off and we would be, you know, much more interactive and close contact and everything else that we were used to. And again, that world has not come back to us yet, hopefully soon. So we're going to be talking about some of the challenges that our kids face and how we here at the Autism Project help to support those challenges for students, for families and the community. As Dr. Gaines said, my name is Ariana DeAngelis. I'm the training manager here at the Autism Project. So I am in charge of our professional training component. Dr. Gaines mentioned my educational background. In terms of my, my work background, I actually started as a special education teacher at the League School of Greater Boston, working with boys with autism ages 16 to 22, then transitioned and worked overseas in an international school, where I was teaching children with autism preschool through fifth grade, and then back here to the States where I taught middle and high school students with autism in Malden, Massachusetts. So I'm very familiar with that transition and that going back to school and what that looks like for a lot of our kids. But again, this is a different year. So there are a lot of other challenges. So with that, I'm gonna get started with the PowerPoint. 
please don't hesitate. You can probably already hear it. I get out of breath because I get excited about stuff and then I, I wear myself out. So don't hesitate, throw a question in the chat, throw an example. If I'm touching on something that hits home for your student and your child, by all means, put that in the chat. And as we go through, we'll talk about some of the resources that we have as they apply to each of these challenges. So with that, I will share my screen. So back to school with the Autism Project. Confirming, I can definitely see your pretty pictures. Thanks. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much. So let's talk a little bit first about who we are here at the Autism Project. We, as an organization, are we're celebrating our 20th year this year, and we came out of the public school system where teachers recognized this challenge with finding information and education about working with students with autism. And I'll tell you, I got my master's degree in 2014, master's in special education, maybe spent two days talking about autism, and 90% of my students had a diagnosis of autism. So that knowledge gap still stands for teachers. So these teachers recognized a need and these parents recognized a need. Oftentimes parents are sent home with a diagnosis of autism and given a list of specialists to meet with, but not given education on what that diagnosis means and how to support the child with that particular diagnosis. So these, these families and these teachers came together and created the Autism Project with the idea that parents and teachers received the same information, the same training. And when everybody had that information across the board, then we could truly support the child. There was that homeschool connection and consistency across environments. So we still, 20 years later, strive for that same idea. So I, as the training manager, I work on the professional trainings. So many of the people that I train include teachers, but also first responders. I did a training recently for judges and parole officers, mental health workers, doctors, nurses, et cetera, et cetera. We were privileged to do a training at Newport Hospital as well a couple of weeks ago. And I can't tell you how in awe I was of the folks that showed up, nurses that were on the floor with our folks with autism, asking questions, what can we do? How can we help? Providing visuals. We, we made a recorded training that people could watch at their leisure. We also have our family support branch and their role is twofold. Well, more than twofold they take parent calls throughout the day. So any parent who suspects their child may have autism, any, child, any family who's new to a diagnosis, any family that's struggling can call the Autism Project. And we have a family support manager who speaks English and a family support specialist who speaks both English and Spanish. So they provide guidance for families and also for self-advocates. We receive a lot of phone calls from folks on the spectrum who are looking for services. I've tried this, this, and this, where do I turn? And Susan and Minnie Ortiz, who's our Spanish speaking FSS specialist, provide them with resources, guidance, suggestions, so that they can get the help that they need. We also have our social groups here at the Autism Project. So they start two weeks, I think, the week of October 12th, and we have all different social groups. We have life skills groups, music groups, dance groups, and that's an opportunity for students on the spectrum up to young adults to come here to the Autism Project and learn life skills, social skills, communication skills, self-regulation techniques. So if you're interested in those, I'll put all these uh, links in the chat at the end, or you can, you're welcome to email me and I'll give you more information. And then we also have a summer camp, as you can see here in this picture. It's called Camp Wanna Go Again, one word, and it takes place over two weeks over the summer. We were back in person this year, which was really exciting. It was definitely a challenge for us with COVID and everything else, but we really felt like this was a safe space for children with autism. A lot of times kids with autism, depending on their level of need or the behaviors that they might uh, exhibit, may not be able to go to a traditional summer camp. So this is an opportunity to provide a safe space. It's entirely visually supported. So schedules, 
and we every staff member has uh, visual supports uh, on a lanyard around their neck to use regularly. Everything was set up for the person with autism specifically. And we had an incredible two weeks at summer camp. So I feel very lucky to be a part of that as well. So our, our role here at the Autism Project is to support folks with autism, to support families of people with autism and to support professionals who are engaging with folks on the spectrum. And when we say professionals, we no longer mean just teachers. As I said, we mean first responders, we mean medical professionals, because with the right information and with the right knowledge, if everybody understands the, the basics of autism, we truly improve the quality of life for so many people, so many neurodiverse folks. So with that, <laughs> with that proclamation about what we do, let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges with back to school and that transition back. And I always, people make fun of me <laughs> because this is my favorite slide in all of the presentations that we do. And people always say, but this is so boring. It's just a definition. It's the American Psychological Association's definition of autism. In the month of April, I must have seen it 500 times on the news for Autism Awareness Month. What does it really mean though? And the reason I love this slide so much is for that word in bold, neurodevelopmental. So autism spectrum disorder is a neurodevelopmental disorder. Before I even worked at the Autism Project, when I was a teacher in Malden, I heard about their online webinars. We have two. And you have to take a pretest for the webinar. It said, autism is a behavior disorder, true or false. And I wasn't really thinking about it. We all know when we have to get credits for things, CEUs, that sometimes we just check stuff off on the pretest. And I was like, I don't know, true. As I said, I didn't spend much time learning about autism in school. And I didn't realize the, the true distinction between a neurodevelopmental disorder and a behavior disorder. So I'll give you a quick example. I was doing a consultation in a kindergarten classroom supporting a young boy with autism. And he was sitting in his desk and he was banging his foot against the ground, making a lot of noise. The kids around him were saying, Joe, be quiet, you're too loud. And I use the name Joe for every male student just to protect their identity. You're too loud. And the teacher's redirecting him. He's been sitting for about an hour and 15 minutes because COVID, because he wasn't able to get up and play in the same way, because there were a lot of restrictions about close contact. He's looking up at the ceiling and banging his leg, trying to get some input to keep himself regulated. On the other side of the classroom, there's a young boy with a behavior disorder, and he's banging his leg against the ground, just like my student. And the kids around him are going, Joe, you're too loud. I can't think. I'm trying to read. And the teacher's redirecting him. And he's looking around to see who is responding to him. And then he gets a little louder. Then the teacher starts to ignore him on purpose to not give him attention. So then he starts with his fist and he's looking for that outside reaction. Whereas my student was doing the same behavior, banging his foot, making the same amount of noise, but he was supporting his internal environment, his self-regulation the way that his neurology was processing his experience led to what we see on the surface, that behavior. And so often our students with autism are judged through that behavioral lens. What is he trying to get out of this behavior? What is, he's trying to upset me. He's trying to get attention. He's trying to set everybody off. But if we understand that autism is a neurodevelopmental challenge and that that neurology results in what we see on the surface, the entire way that we approach supporting people with autism changes. Once we understand that word in bold, a lot of times we think that people with autism experience the world in the same way that a neurotypical person does, but the reactions are different. But that's not the case. People with autism or with any neurodiversity experience the world in a different way. And once we learn that, and once we can support that, we can improve across the board, across settings for everyone. That's why that's my favorite slide. <laughs> can you see now? So transitioning back to school, back to in-person learning, what challenges might there be? Feelings and emotions. That's a big one for every single child 
What's happening? I'm not used to this process. This is new. I haven't done this in a year. What does it look like now? Because I've been out of school or school last year had more restrictions or school last year looked different. What are the new expectations? The social challenges that come for all children, but now for students with autism, they're now learning new social rules, wearing masks, interacting with people without being able to see the bottom of their face, without being able to see their lips moving. That's a social challenge. We're no longer interacting physically as much. That's a new challenge. And for neurotypical people, a lot of times you observe and learn and, and find from your environment that information of how you're going to change that social behavior. Even I, I had an in-person training today and another one yesterday. And in my head, I was thinking, okay, is this group going to shake hands? So what I'll do is I won't shake hands, but I'll go up and I'll introduce myself. If they put their hand out, then maybe I'll shake their hand. You know, you kind of work through that in your head, but it's a completely different social expectation than what we've had previous to COVID. So there's a challenge. Then we add sensory challenges. A lot of folks with ASD have challenges with sensory input. They may be hypersensitive to sensory input. So they may be, have an oversensitivity or hyposensitive, maybe an undersensitivity or an under responsiveness to sensory input. But if you've been home-based or out of school for a prolonged period of time, you're in a situation where your sensory input is very well controlled for most. So you're having just what's going on around your home, around your very local community, and now you're back in school with the sight, the sounds, the smells, the textures, the crowds that come with that. So we're adding some sensory challenges there as well. And then difficulty with change and uncertainty, which again is hard for everyone, but for people with autism who rely on routine, having this upset and uncertainty and change in the way things always have been can be really challenging. So when we think about uh, autism, this is one statistic out of the research on autism that up to 84% of people with ASD have a coexisting anxiety challenge as well, when compared to 18% of the general community has this diagnosis. So going into thinking about how to support our kids, these are things that we need to understand as it relates to autism. Now, if you folks have the slides, I'm not sure if you have access to them or not, but on the next slide, there are some headlines. And I pulled these headlines from the news. I usually sit, I've done this presentation several times and I sit in front of the news for an hour and I write down the headlines because we're thinking about what our students are now being exposed to and what they're hearing from teachers, from other students, et cetera. So you can see here, these are a few headlines that I pulled after watching the news for an hour. So when we're thinking about the challenges surrounding COVID and what some students as they're transitioning back to school might be hearing from peers, we have to make sure that we, as those that support children on the spectrum, are very aware of what we are speaking about around them and exposing them to. So Dr. Tony Atwood, father of research on Asperger's syndrome or that what's now called level one autism and literal father, he has a son with level one autism, said it's important to remember that kids with autism have an acute sensitivity to anxiety in others. Anxiety is contagious. Kids with autism are feeling the pain of the world. They see scenes on television and have such empathy, they have trouble moving on from what they have seen. So this quote is actually in, in reference to the COVID-19 pandemic. And he's speaking about teachers and families being very aware of the conversations that they're having in front of their students. Uh, autism comes from the word auto and this real misconception that people with autism lack empathy or lack social motivation, when really we know that that is so far from the truth and such a huge misconception. So we really have to be conscious of how we're interacting with our students, with our children, as it relates to both this transition back to school, the concerns that we all have, and how we can foster this calm behavior. So if fear is contagious, so is calm. 
modeling calm behavior is huge, huge for anyone that we're supporting on the spectrum, whether it be a child or an adult, limiting exposure to some of these challenging conversations, limiting, and again, I know how hard all of this is, especially when we are a year and a half in and we're all having some of us more than others, these really challenging experiences and maybe worried about a family member and all of these things. But we're just talking about being very conscious of what we're exposing our kids to, limiting negative and pessimistic talk, but being honest and reassuring and practical. So not lying to, to our kids, but being honest and as it says here, practical. And it's really helpful for many students to model some of your coping strategies. So talking out loud is some of the ways that you cope with some of these challenges. And it doesn't just have to be about COVID here and the transition back to school. This is a life skill that's really beneficial for many of our kids. And I will say, I keep saying for many, for most, for some, Dr. Stephen Shore, who is a professor who was diagnosed with autism, he works at Adelphi. If you haven't heard of him or read his work or listened to him speak, please look him up, Dr. Stephen Shore, S-H-O-R-E. He's incredible. And he says, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. So every child with autism is different. Every adult with autism is different. So I don't want to imply that every one of these characteristics applies to every child. Every one of these strategies works for every child. Everyone is different. And we'll talk about some of these strategies for you to try out. And then again, I'm happy to hang on and talk through any specifics as well. So if you see anxiety increasing, you also might notice some other things increasing. You may see some social withdrawal or some heavier reliance on routine, maybe a little bit more increase in sensory sensitivity or some more engagement in the child's special interest. So they might be more engaged in let's say as an example, many of my students had a special interest in trains. So you might see more engagement with those trains if the child is feeling anxious. Another thing that I did wanna mention was context. So context is this idea of taking what you know about a situation and kind of pulling your past experience and applying it to help you process and understand situation. So if we think about a drop of water, for example, you may have a drop of water in a glass and then that drop of water means that's left over from a drink. If you see it on a leaf, maybe it just rained. If you see it in the morning on a blade of grass, maybe it's dew. If you see it on a forehead, sweat, on a cheek, could be a tear. If that person is smiling, happy tears, frowning, sad tears. So it's a drop of water in each situation, but you're applying context to it to understand what that drop of water is, a drink, a raindrop, a tear, et cetera. Context blindness can be a challenge for some folks on the spectrum. Difficulty applying context. So an example would be a colleague of mine who has a son on the autism spectrum and he's in college he locked himself out of his dorm and he called public safety and they said, please leave your name and number and I'll return your call as soon as possible. And he had difficulty there because he didn't know what number they wanted. Was it a license number, a social security number, a room number, a badge number? What number were they asking for? Now, if all of us on the call here leave your name and number, we think, ah, phone number. They need my phone number. But in this case, he had a difficulty applying context to know what that word number meant. Now, how do we use context day to day? When we think about some of the challenges surrounding COVID-19 and going back to school, we have a lot of uncertainty still. There are a lot of things we think we know and then we're not sure. And, and so we apply context to them to help us cope, to help us process or understand. But for some of our folks who have difficulty applying context, that's where we come in. So even making a chart like this, here are some things we don't know. We don't know when you can take your mask off in school. We don't know if there will be another lockdown. Hopefully not, knock on wood. We don't know if you'll have summer camp this summer. 
but we can use visuals like this, like a list that you can sit down and create with your child. Yeah, there's still these unknowns and that's really hard, but what do we know? We know you can play games with friends on the computer. We know that every crisis has a beginning and an end, and we know there will always be more healthy people than sick people. Using visual supports like these can be really helpful for our kids on the spectrum as we're transitioning them back to school and they might be struggling with some of these continued unknowns. Many folks on the spectrum are black and white thinkers. This or it's this. So to not have an answer to when can I take my mask off, especially if that's a sensory challenge too, especially for all of us, we all know that feeling of the little hairs on your face, <laughs> especially I do a lot of my in-person presentations with a mask on and it just feels so texturally grating after a while. So for our kids with significant sensory challenges that have to wear a mask and then they come to us and say, well, when can I take it off? I don't know is a tough answer. So having lists like this can be helpful to visually represent for students what information we know, applying context to help them make sense of the situation. For our students having sensory challenges, definitely consult with an occupational therapist. And then we have on our website, which again, I'll put all of the links into the chat at the end of this presentation, we have something called How to Teach. It's a resource on our website. And anybody, Newport or otherwise, can go on and print out packets on how to teach certain life skills. And one of the really important life skills for all of us is how to request a break. We all take breaks all the time, whether we just you know, ask to use the bathroom and walk out and take a few minutes to sort of zone out or check your phone. You may get up if you work in an office and just go for a lap and come back, you may go for a drive and come back. When we're all feeling overwhelmed, we have that ability to say, I need a minute. So on our website, we have packets on how to teach requesting a break. This is a life skill that's going to be extraordinarily important as we transition into the new school year. And again, we're almost at October and we still, this transition is going to take a while because everything is so new, because last year was so different. Transitioning is going to take time and requesting a break is not something that the child's only gonna need for a few months. It's something that they're going to need for the entirety of their lives. So absolutely go on our website, how to teach is what the tab is called. And you can download all of those packets. We also have an affiliation with Hasbro Toys through Toy Box Tools. And again, I'll put that in the chat as well. And you can go to Toy Box Tools and download visuals for break, for help, for my turn, your turn. So again, the packets and the visuals go hand in hand and they, you can have access to outside Newport, outside Rhode Island, anyone with a computer and the internet can go on and download these resources for free. And if you have any questions about them, you can email me and we can talk it through. And then medical considerations, just something to think about is that some folks with ASD exhibit signs of illness in different ways than neurotypical people. So it's always good to be extra vigilant because you may not see those outward signs of fatigue or challenges such as that. So you may need to be a little bit more vigilant in monitoring for those differences. How any of us could be more vigilant than, than we've all been in the last two years, I do not know. So how can we help? We've talked about a lot of challenges and that can be overwhelming to talk about challenges, but there are so many resources out there and so many things that we can do as a community to support people through this transition. And yes, we're talking about back to school. And yes, we're talking about our kids or our students, but this applies to adults as well. Autism doesn't end at 22 when people graduate. So this is really important to support people throughout their life. So routine. Routine is really, really helpful for many folks on the spectrum. You can see here two quotes from self-advocates that talk about how necessary it is to create routine when there's been a change. So if you're a teacher, implementing schedules, and we'll see that on the next slide. If you're a parent, working with the teacher so that the schedule process carries across the day. 
and making sure that that schedule is meaningful to the child, having things on that schedule that the child enjoys and likes to engage with as well as things on this schedule that may be a little bit more challenging, maybe some academics, all visually represented and accurately maintained. So if we look at this next screen here, these are all different options for schedules. And in that how to teach section, we have how to teach schedules that goes through the different ways to introduce a schedule. And they can take so many different forms. They can be a board maker. Board maker is a software you can get to create schedules. This one here, my nighttime schedule, is an app called ChoiceWorks. This is just my uh, phone, not Outlook, the um, Apple phone calendar that I use. There's other uh, apps. Checklist Plus is a good one where you can just create a free checklist and go down. It helps to visually map out what the child or adult is doing throughout their day. What am I doing now? What am I doing after that? Where am I going? Answering those WH questions to, again, give a little bit more structure to the day and make this challenging transition predictable and meaningful for the child or the adult. You can also use, and again, feel free to jump in with any question you can hear me like, <gasps> so feel free to jump in if you have anything that you want to comment on. We also have first then boards, which are really helpful. And again, the link you see on the screen is what the Autism Pro- Project provides through Hasbro for free. Just a first then board. So it doesn't have to be a full long schedule. It can just be, this is what I'm doing first. This is what I'm doing next. And we have a lot of information. We also have our Autism Project YouTube channel, which walks you through how to use the first then board. I, I'm saying I'm going to put a lot of links in the chat. If I forget any of these links, <laughs> just remind me and I'll throw them all in. And I'll also give you my email address. Social stories. Social stories are incredibly helpful for helping our students to transition, to understand a concept, to process a change. Social stories you can see here were invented by or started by Carol Gray. She's a speech language pathologist. And you can go to her website and download pre-made social stories to help students through certain transitions. You can also write your own. And again, she provides the criteria on her website. You can also write a social narrative. So here's one for masks. This one's tough because again, it involves sort of restriction. You can't see the person's face. There might be some sensory challenges there, but here's an example. I can keep people safe by wearing a mask. A mask will prevent germs from spreading to other people. Almost everyone is wearing a mask right now. This keeps us healthy. When I wear a mask, it's important that it covers my nose and mouth. This might feel funny. This might feel like it's hard to breathe. It is okay. I can still breathe. I can take my mask off at home with family or when I'm outside away from other people. So this is just an example. It was written by our family support team here at the Autism Project. If you're struggling and you feel you need a social narrative and don't know where to start, giving our family support team a call is absolutely a great starting point. Susan has written so many social narratives for me, for my work in consultations as well. And it just helps to provide a little bit more information. I'm wearing this mask, but why am I wearing this mask? What is it going to feel like? Will I be okay? Outlining for the child's information. And when you're writing a social narrative, making sure that it's at the level that the child can access. So I've written social narratives for some of my students that were much more simple that were just maybe one, two, maybe three sentences outlining something. I've also written social narratives using symbols rather than words to help explain a scenario. So it's really about just giving context to and understanding to new and potentially uncertain developments or times or instances or requirements like wearing a mask here. This is one that's a bit more complex or a bit more intricate. So you can see here, this is a social narrative about social distancing and it breaks down all of the different requirements on social distancing. 
You can also use video modeling. And I won't show you this whole video <laughs> because I'm very conscious of the time. I, I talk a lot, <laughs> so I want to make sure I give everybody a chance. But showing children videos of new situations can be really helpful as well. Something new that's going to change about the school or going into a new classroom or changing of a schedule that you can visually represent through a video can be helpful. So we'll just look at a quick snippet of this one. Going back to school will look a lot different this year with some new expectations to keep us all safe. Here are a few things you need to know. On the bus, there will be a limit of two students per seat and seating charts will be created to allow for groupings of students based on the bus stop. Students will be asked to wear their masks and to keep their distance from others when exiting the bus. Staff will be greeting students as they arrive at school, asking how they're feeling and making sure they're wearing their masks over their nose and mouth. Parents are asked to take their children's temperature at home and keep them at home if they're sick. Some students will be directed to the nurse if they say they didn't get their temperature checked at home. Parents should not try to enter the school building at drop-off or pickup. Your school should have plenty of hand sanitizer for everyone. Just in the interest of time, I won't show you the whole thing. But this is an example of using videos to preview for students something new. So these children were going back to school. It was a complete change in routine. So they took videos to show what that would look like. Now, this is a fancy production level video, but it doesn't have to be that at all. Nothing has to be fancy. We've all got some kind of a phone in our pocket. You can take out your phone as a teacher and show videos of your classroom. You can do a point of view video. So from the point of standing outside, walking into the school, walking to the classroom, scanning the classroom, just showing the child what's new and what to expect. Or if there's anything new like a field trip or a new class or a new procedure as COVID evolves and things change, previewing with a video can be really, really helpful in helping the child to understand, here's what I need to expect. I think all of us could benefit from video previews in a lot of ways. I know I, whenever I go to a new place, I get a little bit nervous. I went to a school yesterday to do a presentation. I'd never been to the town that it was in, didn't know anything about the school, didn't know anyone there. And I started to get nervous and I thought, oh, I should have looked the school up on YouTube. I bet they have a video on there just to watch it, just to see what is it going to look like? What can I expect? So this is really helpful for everybody, but especially for our folks with autism who have potentially anxiety about the unknown and anxiety about transitions and what will it look like and what will it be like when I get there, video modeling is really, really helpful for many students on the spectrum. And then it can be a visual reminder. It can just be a picture. It doesn't even have to have some of these breakdowns here that you see. Um, it can. So this picture helps me to remember what it looks like when I'm wearing a mask. I wear a mask when I'm not at home, and then it breaks down how to wear one. But it can just be a picture. Some of our students are not going to be readers at this point. So just having a picture. I recommend, obviously, this is a stock photo. This person is not in elementary school or middle or high school. But if you're having this for a specific child, having a picture of them doing the activity rather than a stock photo is really helpful. I've even made books for some of my students or some of the consults that I do. So I'll say, okay, let's think about some of our rules. What are they? Okay, what he, and the child would say, walk safely in the hallway, um, quiet hands, no leaning on other students, blah, 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 blah. So we would say, okay, let's see what that looks like. And he would show me and I would take pictures and then I'd make a little flip book for him. Joe's rules at school. And he would read it to me every day and it would be a picture of him in each situation. It just helps to give that little reminder of the expectation. So it helps students to adjust to some of these new challenges. And then providing structure at home as well is really helpful. A lot of times, and I'm the most guilty of this of anyone as a teacher, when I first started out in teaching back in 
I don't even know, 1970. I can't even remember when that was. I thought, oh, I'm putting all this structure in place in school. So when they're home, they should just be able to relax. But this structure and this predictability and these schedules and visuals really help to reduce anxiety for many folks on the spectrum. It's not putting all of these expectations in place, but rather giving context and outlining what's to come. So it's really helpful for many students. So this is just an example of a workstation that was set up for a student who was working from home for a particular time. And it just had some labels. Again, this is not at all fancy, but it's just, here's where my work goes. Here's where my finished work goes. And <laughs> the finished work bin hadn't been cleared out in a while and a little bit of structure for that particular student. And we also have to keep in mind that some students did flourish in that remote learning environment. So this is Hari, and I'm, I know I'm gonna pronounce his last name wrong, and I try every time, Srinivasan, I believe. He is now, he speaks entirely through a device or mainly through a device like a, an iPad. He is teaching a class at UCLA through that iPad, which I think is incredible. And he talks about how Zoom, he said here is ironically equalizing because as he's in this presentation, everybody's on mute. So even students who can talk don't have that ability in that moment. He says here, control of the camera puts me in charge of the amount of atypical body mannerisms that others get to notice. Remote work also reduces a lot of the anxieties around the constant societal need for physical social interaction, eye contact, and trying not to draw attention to my atypical mannerisms, all of which takes up extra mental effort and energy. So I'm actually able to get a lot more done now. So we have to consider this perspective as well as we're moving kids back into that in-person learning environment. That for some students, remote learning was really, really hard. For a lot of students, it was really, really difficult. Some students weren't able to attend to Zoom. I worked with a young man here in social groups, and one of his groups was over Zoom. The others were in person. And the one that was over Zoom, he wasn't able to attend to, and he had to leave the group. Just wasn't engaging over Zoom. In person, fabulous. For other students, like Hari here, he shares that Zoom was really beneficial. So as we're moving kids back into the routine of in-person learning, some of that transition away from Zoom and remote, away from remote, excuse me, may be challenging. And I do want to leave time for questions. So I'm going to end on this slide here. For those teachers that are with us and also for families, some of the things that we need to consider. Parents or guardians of children with ASD may be experiencing. And if any of you are parents, feel free to add examples in the chat or any, any stories you would like to share. There's a significant problem across the country right now, definitely in the state of Rhode Island, with hiring support services. Past workers, HBTS workers, even workers at adult service organizations. So some of our students that graduated from school last year are not yet transitioning into an adult day program because there's no one to work with them. So that's a significant challenge. One of my coworkers here at the Autism Project has a son, he's 25. He has level three autism, what used to be called sort of classic autism. And he is home-based now. He used to go to his program every day that shut down with COVID. And now she's trying to hire workers to work with her son during the day to take him out into the community, but there's just not enough applicants out there. So she, her work is disrupted as you can see here, employment interruption, because oftentimes she doesn't have anyone to work with her son during the day. So she has to, so she may have to work from home or she may have to take days off here and there. And we being the autism project, no problem. We understand that we live this every day, but a lot of employers are not going to be as flexible. So that can be really challenging. Additional isolation due to child's resistance to PPE. This is a big one. A young man that I work with here in our social groups cannot tolerate a mask. So his ability to join in-person indoor activities is very limited, especially as more and more mask requirements 
come up. And then challenges supporting the child during remote learning, which may or may not be applicable at this point for you folks, but I had just mentioned that story, that some folks, it's really hard to engage over Zoom and Zoom is just not the platform for them. So families are going through all of these challenges. And a lot of times we think now, well, you know, we're kind of back, we're in person learning, we're back into the groove, things are improving. And yes, that is true to a degree, but families are still experiencing a lot of the residual challenges, particularly that lack of support services outside of the school day. So what can we do? One thing is having realistic expectations for students and families, knowing that families may be struggling right now with this lack of support services, with a lot of these challenges with the day-to-day, um, with uh, schools suddenly or classrooms suddenly going remote if there's an outbreak, there's a lot of challenges there. So having realistic expectations of parents and families and of students is really important, especially when we're talking about students, allowing them to request and take breaks as needed to adjust to this new period. Providing training, it's exactly what we're doing right now. <laughs> we're talking about some of these challenges and what the Autism Project can do to help. And then providing training and support to families. So we do have here at the Autism Project, and I will put the flyer in the chat, so I wanna make sure I leave room for that too. We have a parent support group starting in October, not tomorrow, next week, I believe it starts. It's called Parent to Parent, and it is a five-week series, and each week covers a different topic. So I believe the first week is the basics of ASD, then there's visual supports, visual supports in practice, positive behavior, and positive advocacy. So working together as a team and advocating for your child. So the, the function of parent to parent is really twofold. The first is that it allows parents to learn more about the diagnosis of autism. So we talked about that's really where the autism project started, giving education to professionals and to parents so that everyone has the same understanding. It's called parent to parent because it's taught by parents of children on the spectrum. So my colleagues here at the Autism Project, all of the family support team has children on the autism spectrum. So I don't get involved at all in the parent to parent. I don't teach it at all. I don't have kids. So it's really important for us here at the project to have parents who have walked this road to be instructing these classes. So it gives you the opportunity to get information, but it also gives you the opportunity to meet and talk with other parents because it can be, especially now, extremely isolating. So having the opportunity to connect with other parents, to share your stories amongst each other, to learn from each other is essential. So again, I will put that information in the chat as well. If we do have families on here also who are looking for past workers, HBTS, or looking for where to start, how to apply, how to sign up, looking for respite, we do provide or we do organize respite services here at the Autism Project as well. So I'll put my email in the chat. Anything that all of you need, please don't hesitate to email me and then I'll send it out to the correct professional, to our respite folks, to our social group folks, to our family support folks, to get you the information and the assistance that you need. And with that, I will open the floor for questions. If I haven't overwhelmed awesome. anybody. No, that was awesome. So, you know, even on a virtual setting, the passion that you have for this topic and how energetic you are, um, obviously a very dynamic speech or speaker. So you must be a great teacher and, and keep people engaged. So that was a fantastic okay. talk. Not just me saying that there was lots of chats about, um, will this be recorded? I want to share this with lots of people. Um, I oh, put in no. that everybody needs to hear this stuff. Um, and then lots of requests for, you know, the slides and the information and things. So um, there's a huge, huge appetite for the stuff that you're talking about, because there's a huge need, quite frankly. Um, and just, uh, you know, I was struck by the fact that um, a lot of the, the things that you mentioned, like the visual support and how helpful that can be for everybody. Quite frankly, I've found that under, especially under significant stress, 
and I, I worked in the emergency department, um, pretty much all of the rules apply. We all become a little hypersensitive to things. We all probably need a little reassurance. Um, we could all use some tricks and things to calm ourselves down and trying to be a non-anxious presence as the ER doctor who's walking into something catastrophic can sometimes make all the difference. So yes. I practice tried to practice those things as much as I possibly can. And I'm certainly not the bellwether for a neurotypical anything. I'm a little quirky myself, but um, I can only imagine how um, folks that do this every single day and are under that kind of pressure um, must benefit from this. And I think we're all under quite a bit of stress these days with the pandemic. So good lessons for all of us, whether uh, where you're, wherever you're at in your neurodevelopmental state. Um, there was one question that I'm hoping you'll answer if you don't mind, because I have the same question too. Is yeah. Maybe you could um, kind of explain a little bit about sort of some of the terminology, Asperger's versus autism, which you mentioned, yes. um, level one autism. I know there's some kind of older terminology, some newer terminology. Could you help get us a little rundown of those sorts Absolutely. of terms? Absolutely. In fact, let me see if I can pull up one of my other trainings here that has that slide broken out for you. Would that be helpful? Yeah, absolutely. That would be great. Right. Thank you. Have it. Thank you. Let's give it a minute. And while it's opening, Dr. Gaines, you make a great point about how we all benefit from X, Y, and Z. And if you saw my office, if I could turn the, the computer right now, it's cut. I have four calendars. I have the month, the day, the year, I have everything set up. And I use so many visuals. And I also, what you had mentioned about, you know, having, walking into stressful situations, we can all get that feeling of overwhelm and anxiety. You make such a good point there because we often think of autism or autistic behaviors, but they're human behaviors. Dr. Barry Prezant says this. Um, there's a podcast called Uniquely Human. That's fantastic. These are human behaviors. If we all get put under enough pressure, enough stress, enough sensory input, we all hit that wall, but our threshold may be different or our starting point may be different. So you might have a cup that's filled up to the edge and there's just a little bit gets you to overflow, or you might have a big jug that's empty and you can pour a lot in before it gets there, but it's a human behavior and we all, we all go through it. So let me just share my screen here again. Yeah, I love that. Definitely seen uh, lots of people that, um, you know, like you said, some that doesn't take very much to put them over the top, some that have a little bit more uh, capacity and resilience. And I think we can all learn lessons from the latter. And, uh, you know, wherever you're at in the process, we can all learn how to manage ourselves a little bit better sometimes. Absolutely. And and looking for help, getting help yeah. when you need that outside help to, to regulate is, is really important too. Just asking for help with all of us struggle with that, I'm sure. Um, yeah. But for folks on the spectrum, asking for help can be a life skill that needs to be directly taught. And again, pack it on that on our website. Yeah. So yeah. this is a slide breaking down the old terminology for autism and the new terminology for autism. So in 2013, there was this shift from Asperger's syndrome PDD NOS, which is pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, and autism. Among other diagnoses, you might hear Rett syndrome or childhood disintegrative disorder. All of those diagnoses in this 2013 shift became autism spectrum disorder. And they were now level one, level two, level three. So we don't diagnose using the term Asperger syndrome anymore, but you may still hear people identify as having Asperger's or as being an Aspie, quote unquote, um, but it's not, tip, it's not used in the diagnostic terminology anymore. And something that's really important to think about here is that it's not that ASD level one is a little bit of autism and ASD level two is a medium autism and ASD level three is a lot of autism. But what it is, is that these two areas of challenge, social communication and interaction and fixed and repetitive patterns and behaviors interest and activities, that these two areas look different and affect the person differently, depending on where you are along the spectrum here. So you may have someone with ASD level one who is really, really verbal, really engages a lot using verbal language, but may have a really hard time shifting if there's a schedule change. But you might have someone with ASD level three who has no language but it's much more flexible. So it's just, it's different for every individual. And a lot of times our level one kids or adults go without the support they need because of that preconceived notion that there's just a little bit of autism. So providing those adequate supports are really important 
across the spectrum. And since I have you for two more minutes, there's also a new way that self-advocates are encouraging us to think about the spectrum. That it's not that you're kind of a point along this line here, but that you are basically a kaleidoscope of skills and challenges that may look different depending on the day, the week, the month, the minute. So you might have somebody that has mild sensory challenges, but in periods of high stress, those challenges are extreme. Or someone who's incredibly verbal, but then at meltdown periods is completely non-speaking at all, can't communicate verbally. So it really just depends. It's not that they're just one single point on this continuum for the entirety of their lives, but that all of these strengths and challenges impact them in different ways compared to other people with autism and compared to themselves, depending on the challenges that they have. So we always encourage people to think of autism as an iceberg. I'm going into a new presentation now, but this is the last slide, I promise. So all of these challenges that we see on the surface, we need to think about what's going on below the surface that's leading to what we see. So if we're seeing aggression, or self-injury or shutting down, or you might see a child that's being rude or they're disorganized or they're perseverating and asking lots of questions. Well, what's going on below the surface? What challenges are they facing that are leading to what we see on the surface? And then how can we support those? And I'll stop sharing slides. <laughs> yeah, that's great. No apologies. That's a very thorough answer and um, much, much better than I certainly would have been able to cobble together, even just with my basic understanding of the vocabulary. So that's fantastic. Um, another kind of vocabulary question, which I love um, from Mary is, um, can you maybe um, have any introduction to mainstreaming, which is the word she uses when autism students have an interest in music, art, sports, things like that. So do um, you have thoughts about uh, that concept, especially with special interests and things that kids are passionate about? Absolutely. So Mary, correct me if I'm misunderstanding. because it's, it's been a long day, so it's possible. But thinking about students that might be in a substantially separate classroom or partial separate classroom, but go into mainstream for like you said, gym, art, recess, those sorts of things. When I was teaching in Malden, I was teaching a sub-separate room for middle and high school students. So 14 to 18, I think it was. And they were, they went into specials at certain times of the day. For gym, we had unified sports. So that was neurotypical peers who signed up to buddy with my students and to play different sports or physical activities. Some of my students who were really interested in art went to the mainstream art classes. Others didn't. So really allowing them to choose what their high interest was and also to determine how the, you know, the other factors, is it going to be too overstimulating for them? Is it going to be too anxiety provoking? Can we kind of slowly start to introduce them into that few minutes at a time? What kind of supports are available in terms of, can they go with a para? Are they going independently? So if it's the child's interest, and I absolutely, absolutely advocate for being in mainstream classrooms as much as possible. So just making sure that the child is well-regulated, that they're enjoying that inclusion process. I think that's a, a fabulous idea. And of course there's variables for each individual, but overall, I absolutely endorse it. Awesome. I think I answered the question. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> I don't know if I black out when I'm answering no, questions. feel free to type more details. Um, and then um, she also asked about how are you, your, what about finances? How are you supported? So maybe you can speak a little bit about the state, federal funding, other um, sources of support financially for your work. Absolutely. So that's a loaded question. Our financial resources vary. So we're a part of Lifespan. We are incorporated into Lifespan under Gateway Health. We receive grants at the state and national level. So right now we have grants from the health equity zones of Woonsocket, Central Providence, and Bristol Warren. We also have a grant from the Department of Justice that is specific to training on elopement. So students who students or adults who are leaving a designated area and it's in an unsafe way and how we can help with that. We, that funding also covers our training of police and fire department, as well as dispatch within Rhode Island. Some of our training is paid 
So a lot of organizations hire me and our team to go out and do trainings. So uh, I would say probably this year, maybe 60% of the training budget came from being hired by other organizations. This year, we are privileged because it's our 20th year, we are donating trainings to overseas organizations, which is really exciting. So in October, we have a training with early interventionist in uh, Eswatini, formerly Swaziland. So I think that's really an exciting new frontier for us. We also have funding from respite. So we do receive some percentage of, of uh, return when we set up respite plans for folks. And then there's additional funding that comes from, again, various grants outside of the training work I do, and then development. So we have our development department that reaches out to businesses. We have a lot of folks that fundraise for us very graciously. There was I wish I could remember the name of it. There was some kind of battle of the bands for us recently that raised a, a good portion of money. And then we have our Imagine Walk every year. It's been hard the last two years. Obviously, we couldn't hold it because it'd be a super spreader event for sure. <laughs> Thousands of people usually go. So we did one virtually, but it's not the same as, as our in-person walk. So we're hoping to get back to that next year in Goddard Park as well. And I'm sure I'm leaving something out that'll come to me in the middle of the night, but that's the, the summary of our funding. Well, yeah, I certainly would encourage anyone who is ex as excited about this as you are to, to support your organization too. And I know um, we at Lifespan definitely do. Um, one quick shout out to Pam McLaughlin who put a little comment in the chat too. I know you know Pam and um, I share her. Thank you for your passion, your knowledge about this and um, totally agree. Such an asset that if um, folks need support, I would, my one ask as we wrap up is if you don't mind going into the chat box and typing in an email address, um, if folks are able to email you, I'll leave the, um, the team or the meeting open and the chat box open so folks have a chance to kind of copy and paste or jot it down. Um, but please, please, please reach out to Ariana. Thank you so much for your passion, for your hard work you. and um, all of the hard work that you do to help um, not only the, the students that you teach that um, have uh, challenges and they're on the spectrum, the parents, the families that support them, the educators, and of course, myself and other healthcare professionals um, that we want to care for these folks in a way that's the most appropriate and sensitive to what their needs are and be able to help them. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, it helps all of us to know how to manage a little bit better under stressful times. So lessons learned that we can all take um, a little bit from. And I think, you know, it's just really incredible stuff that you're doing. Um, great organization, proud to be a part of it and that we have it here in Newport. Um, and I can say that I've used your services when we have patients and families that come into the emergency department, which is about as highly stimulating and stressful of an environment as you can imagine. Um, yeah. And most of the time, somebody that is there is either sick or someone they love is sick. And so that's really hard as well. So um, we've certainly called you in to kind of uh, help provide assistance. And we've had um, some kids that have needed to be in the hospital for quite some time. So you've been of a tremendous support for them and for their families to help them get through that encounter. So immensely grateful for the work you've already done and for this presentation, which has been fantastic. So thank you so much. Thank you. And I share that gratitude as well. I hold, you know, the teachers, the parents, the doctors, everybody that's on the front lines right now during this extraordinary time that doesn't seem to be ending the way that we thought it was going to you know you guys are the heroes you're keeping this country open you're keeping our kids educated the families are dealing with this incredible stress and you you keep going every day you got you guys are my hero so if i can give you something some little bit of knowledge that's enough for me that's that's everything so thank you all so much and i'm continuing to put links in the chat i'm probably going to forget some of them but i'm I'll give it the old college try. I'm yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah, put in as many as you can. Um, and like I said, I will turn off my video, but I'll leave the, um, the Zoom meeting open for a little bit so folks have a chance. Um, and then it looks like a few are putting their emails in too. So this was recorded and we'll also get um, record of the chat. That's part of the function in Zoom. So we can get all that information. So if you're putting emails into the um, chat box, that's really helpful. And we'll make sure we can get some of this information sent over to you as well. Um, and just as a bit of a preview of coming attractions, we do this every month. And so in October, I have a couple of our orthopedic surgeons joining us. And so if you've ever wanted to have a chance to chat with an orthopedic surgeon, um, that's pretty exciting. So um, that's what we have lined up towards the end of October. So keep an eye out for an invite and spread the word. 
Um, and just another huge thank you again to Ariana. Thank you to Eric for setting up the technology. Thank you for Pam McLaughlin for uh, making all the connections and things. And thank you, Ariana, for you and all of your team at the Autism Project for the great education and helping these kids um, get through day-to-day -day life and helping us grown-ups get through day-to-day -day life. Um, <laughs> it's not always as easy as we like. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Thank you all so much. It's been such a pleasure. And my email's in the chat. Please don't hesitate Perfect. to contact me anytime. Awesome. Thank you, so, Dr. Gaines. Thank you, Eric. Uh, such a great. Take care. Bye yeah, soon. everybody have an awesome night. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll yes. talk soon. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Good night.